At the top of our Sunrise News this morning, the verdicts in the multiple murder trial of Dorothea Puente. A Monterey jury has found the former Sacramento landlady guilty of first-degree murder. Dorothea Puente, unemotional, now knows that the jurors are deadlocked on six of nine murder counts. Patrons spent the afternoon watching the court proceedings and talking about what the trial has done to their neighborhood. From now, where the same jury will consider her punishment for multiple murders. There are only two choices, life without the possibility of parole or death. It's turned into a circus. Welcome to Creep Time with Sightless Dean. Today we are covering the story of the Death House landlady, otherwise known as Dorothea Puente. This is a really eerie case, and it's chilling for a lot of reasons, of course, because of the sinister things that this woman did, but also from the psychological perspective, how well this person was able to manipulate everyone around them for what seemed like decades. This is also not an unsolved case, and I know everybody's been getting on me. They're like, please do a case with closure. This is your case with closure. But I was drawn to it because I think the biggest takeaway and sort of what kind of draws a lot of people into this case specifically is the front-facing image of it, Dorothea. Dorothea is an older woman, and it's very uncommon to sort of see that image in the context of serial killer. But in some ways, we'll get into, you know, why she actually cultivated that image and how she was able to make people around her believe that she was something she wasn't. We're gonna get into a lot of this, and I don't wanna, you know, go overboard with the exposition of the story. I think it's gonna be better if we just kinda dive right into it. But before we do, there are a few orders of business. I would love it if you guys could give a like, a comment, and subscribe below. That's really, really gonna help Creep Time grow much faster, you guys. And you've been so good so far, too. I'm so grateful for, like, the outpouring of support that I've gotten for this content, for this channel. It's really, really exciting, and I want to see it grow more. I want to make more content, and I'm trying to extend to, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram so I can make even more of this type of content for you. So if you want to support it, please, please do those things. And if you want to follow me on those accounts as well to get additional content, you know, especially on TikTok too, you can do so. I'm going to include all of the links to my socials right down in the description. All right, let's get right into this story. So we're going to go into some background about who Dorothea was. Dorothea Puente was born on January 9th of 1929 in Redlands, California. She was one of six other children. Her story kind of reminds me a little bit of Mary Bell, if anyone remembers that from a previous video where she was sort of born into trauma. I mean, Dorothea was the product of two severely dysfunctional and alcoholic parents, and there were episodes of manic behavior, of assault in that household. There were episodes where her father was threatening self-harm in front of her and her siblings. By 1937, her father does end up dying of tuberculosis unexpectedly, and then just one year later, her mother dies as well, leaving her and her other siblings just orphaned. But when they're eventually brought to an orphanage, the abuse and the trauma just continues. I mean, there's such sexual and physical abuse in this place until Dorothea is about 16 years old when she's able to leave. All of this is sort of shaping the mind of who we would come to learn Dorothea really is. It's actually a really unique window into some of the sort of psychological brickwork that was built up over time that really kind of made most of this case infamous. When Dorothea reaches the age of 16, she ends up marrying very young, and she ends up having two children, one of which goes off to live with distant relatives, and the other is put up for adoption. This marriage becomes tumultuous and eventually falls apart, and this is, I think, the earliest indication where things start to sort of spiral and we get a glimpse of erratic behavior. She then marries again in the year 1952, but she goes under a different identity. She ends up going under a different name and tells him that she's actually Muslim and she has an Egyptian and an Israeli background, none of which was true at all. But this sort of period of her life is really just an era of kind of debauchery where she is just drinking so heavily, she is gambling away her husband's money, she's falling apart, really. But while she's sort of engaged in the throes of this lifestyle, it eventually does come to a peak and it comes back to bite her when she's uncovered by police as a brothel owner. She's subsequently arrested, but then she's placed in a psychiatric hospital for evaluation for a little bit because even in these early years, the people who are around her can tell that something's not quite right here. 
This is when we're really getting our first sort of taste of just sort of the variance and how different doctors were viewing her throughout her life. And at this point, the physicians who are evaluating her believe that she just shows kind of cut and dry tendencies, that of a pathological liar. Someone who needed to create another reality for themselves because they were already disassociated from the one they actually lived in. But when she's eventually released, she then reinvents herself yet again. She gets a divorce in the year 1966, and she changes her name to Sharon. But this wasn't just a name change, this was a complete overhaul of her personality in an attempt to hide her dark past. So she's suddenly going under this new name, but she's also adopting characteristics and personality traits and presenting an image of this sort of goodly Christian woman. She re-establishes her relationship in the community as sort of a caregiver, and she ends up opening up a tenant home where she takes in women at first who are in poor states in their life, where they are suffering from addiction, or they have disabilities they're dealing with, or they're homeless. She's creating this sort of safe haven or a refuge for them where they can come and live virtually free of charge for a little bit, and she's sort of presenting herself as this sort of goodly saint. So while living in this sort of goodly life, she ends up marrying again, just two years later, to another man, and that is where she gets the name Puente. But this relationship becomes just as toxic as any of the others before it, and they eventually do separate while she's citing domestic violence, and she threatens him with a number of legal actions, including divorce, including a restraining order, so much so that he becomes frightened, and he flees to Mexico. But what this did was sort of enabled her in a way, it left her behind and to her own devices as the full caregiver of this boarding home that she had created. This would give way to a new era of her life where some of the most egregious acts that this woman would commit would take place in Sacramento. She fully leans into this narrative and she wants to establish herself and her reputation in the community as this sort of saintly matriarch, you know, someone who gives back to everyone. What's kind of shocking to me is just how convincing she really was at manipulating everyone around her to make them believe she was this person. She's very well known in the community, she is attending social events, she's at bars, and people come to know her as sort of a point of contact if there is somebody who's in trouble who needs a place to go. So she's taking in more and more people. She's taking in the elderly, she's taking in the sick, she's taking in people who are battling with severe addiction, helping them to all enroll in their social security and government aid benefits. But appearances aside, there are strange things that are going on throughout the years that people are starting to notice. As time is passing, she is seemingly earning more and more money, which theoretically, if she's taking on additional tenants, that would make sense. The assumption was that she takes in these people and then aids them in signing up for their government aid benefits, and then she is allowed to pocket a portion of those benefits to help with the upkeep expenses of their care and the home. But no one seemed to know what those living expenses really were, or what these fees were that she wanted to charge everyone. Meanwhile, she is continuing to funnel the majority of this money, her income, into the upkeep of this goodly image. You know, she's continuing to go out into social community events because she wants people to see her and talk about her as such, as this version of herself that she's created. But while this is going on, there are kind of rumblings that are coming up periodically where people are talking and they're saying they think she's stealing from them or that she may be pocketing more of the money than she should be or she's taking jewelry. But this all comes to a peak and a lot of it ends up getting uncovered when one of her tenants ends up wandering off and he gets arrested. But while he's in custody, his benefit checks are still somehow being cashed. So an investigation is launched, and all of the evidence ties directly back to Dorothea, who is uncovered as this person who's been extorting all of these people and pocketing the majority of their government benefits. She is of course arrested, and during her sentencing, there is a contingent condition that she is never to be allowed to work in this sort of a setting again. She can't be trusted in this kind of position. But following all this, it really gives way to the darker era of her life because it bore the need for secrecy. So years and years are passing and she's kind of floating around, right? She's moving through different parts of Southern California, she's transitioning through job after job and nothing is really sticking and it's all carrying out through the late 70s. But what she really wants is to get back to what she had originally created. She 
wants to be a caregiver and she wants to get back to having a tenant house and having that kind of control over something or somebody. So she formulates another reinvention. She moves back to Sacramento, but under an even more covert disguise, she completely changes her look. She dresses down in this vintage clothing. She puts on these very large glasses. She stops dyeing her hair. And for all intents and purposes, the goal is to make herself look much older than she actually is. She's really only in about her 50s at this point, but she wants to appear as an old, harmless, non-suspect woman. So eventually, if we cut a little bit, and now that we're into the 80s, you know, she's kind of slowly, slowly building up the potential that she could once again have a boarding home, but she has to do it in secret. So she's only taking on a couple of tenants at a time, she's building this whole thing very under the radar, and she ends up having a man come live with her, an older man, who becomes a romantic partner for her. But if we navigate a little bit around that relationship, this is when things get even more suspicious. This man eventually stops talking to his family for a while. He becomes very angry at them because they're unhappy that he's living with this woman. She has this sort of soiled reputation that they know about. But then suddenly, he touches base with his family. He's writing them letters again, and he's, you know, reestablishing that contact. He eventually says that he's left Dorothea, that he's moved down south. And that becomes the story for a while for everybody around her and in her immediate circle in that area. But it's around this time that she ends up commissioning a handyman to actually come over and do a bit of building for her, a little bit of manual labor. And she said she has this whole array of books that she wants to take and put into storage because she's not sure if she's going to stay there, she might want to move shortly. So he does so. He builds her a crate upon request that is six feet in length to her liking and has a lid. She also sells this handyman a pickup truck, which was her boyfriend's, who she says when he left, he just left it to her, so she just has to get rid of it, so she sells it to him for pretty cheap. Again, oddly enough, no suspicions are raised, and that is until the handyman actually returns, and he finds the crate that he built. It's now nailed shut, assumed to have books in it. And, you know, she's going to pay him and commission him to load it up into the pickup truck that she sold him, and they're going to drive it to this storage facility. And the man does so, you know, he doesn't really think much of it because, again, there are no red flags here when it's front-facing, right? She's just kind of a harmless old lady, she's, you know, caring for all these different people, he views her as sort of a maternal figure, and she's also been employing him so he doesn't want to get on her bad side, so they get the thing into the pickup truck, this crate, and they are driving quite a ways to this storage facility. But in the middle of that drive, when they're kind of in a remote area near this river, she ends up convincing him to stop the truck because she changes her mind. She says, you know what, I just have to get rid of these books. I really don't want to put them in storage, but I don't want to have to pay to dump them in a landfill. Can we just drop them into the fill by the river? Which he does. They leave that crate by the river and they call it a day and they just head back. Unbeknownst to him of the contents of that crate being the old man. The old man who was living with her, who is seemingly still writing letters to his family. By 1986, that same crate is discovered by a fisherman near the river, and he immediately reports it because it looks suspicious. He ends up approaching the crate, and the smell is unbearable. There has to be something in there. Once opened by police, they end up finding the badly decomposed body of the elderly man. It was so badly decomposed that they actually weren't able to identify the body for three years. And no one would suspect that it was this old man because he has never been reported as missing or dead because he's still cashing in his benefits checks and he's still in contact with his family. And this is all under the guise of this image that Dorothea is still just this harmless, elderly, sweet caregiver. So nobody suspects her. Why would they? Meanwhile, she is back and she is moving full force and taking on even more tenants into the boarding house. Nothing sinister of Dorothea is really ever suspected until that of 1988 when one of her tenants is reported missing by his social worker. He's an elderly man who suffers from mental health issues, which of course is distressing, so police do get involved and they come to Dorothea's house to investigate. But when they do, they notice something kind of towards the backyard. It looks like fresh soil almost slightly disturbed in the garden area. 
An officer gets a little suspicious and he decides to get a closer look and that's when it's discovered. Within that soil, they would find eight other bodies from former tenants who are on the property, rotting within the dirt. In total, she was actually responsible for about nine bodies found, but she's so unassuming as a serial killer that when she's initially brought in for questioning about what the story could be here, they end up letting her go so she can go grab a coffee and come back, but she flees to Los Angeles. Once she's there, she tries to sort of con her way into a sort of new relationship, a new place to live, and she sort of befriends an elderly man who she thinks she can kind of get in the bag, but he recognizes her. He recognizes her immediately because there's now public news coverage with her face because she's at large and she's most certainly involved in what was found on that property. She's of course turned into police, and it's believed that at the time when she carried out these murders, she was using sleeping pills or suffocation, and then she would hire ex-cons to come to the property and dig out the plots for the bodies, all while still cashing in the government aid. When this went to court, she was convicted of three of the nine bodies found, but ultimately she does see life in prison until she eventually dies at the age of 82 in 2011 of natural causes. What's fascinating about this is not only the grim sort of scheme of how this whole thing was carried out, but really the long-term manipulation. She was effective at convincing so many people around her for so long that she was somebody that she wasn't. Somebody who was harmless or even here to do good, but also somebody who had this dark secret, this compulsion to kill. So effective that she was manipulating people into actually helping her go along with this scheme. She's convincing families that people who are in her care are thriving and are still alive, when in reality, they could have been dead for months, if not years. The psychological element of this case and Dorothea is really one of the larger mysteries of it because there are wildly different reports in how different doctors who had her in their care saw her and evaluated her. There were some doctors who saw her as a schizophrenic who had pathological tendencies, and then there were other doctors who evaluated her who saw her as completely normal, fit to stand trial. And it's the variance of it is just very odd to me. Could the manipulation and the con artistry of Dorothea have been that good that she could seemingly upkeep this lie of normalcy while figuratively having skeletons in the closet? The home has remained as a sinister staple of the area due to the dark past of its final years of operations. And to her dying day, Dorothea maintained her innocence in that everyone who had died under her care had died of natural causes. All right, that is all for now. Make sure that you leave me a comment below and feel free to talk to me about this case. I would love to hear new suggestions for other true crime cases. They do not have to be unsolved. You know that I love unsolved cases, but I'm very happy to do cases and stories like this as well because this is highly specific, if you know what I mean. This is something that is unique in the way that it presents itself as a case on paper because it is so unassuming and so uniquely specific to this woman's set of circumstances that I, I don't know of many other cases like it. And of course, as always, you can leave me suggestions for stories, other cases, and pictures you want me to cover. I'm happy to check, and I am always happy to cover, and I will catch you on another creep time.